I've talked about this topic every once in a while before, but I really I, I, let me spend a few moments with you on this because I, I think this is probably more important than the the major headlines, the the major economic stuff, and we'll get to all of that. But we've got a lot of new listeners since the last time I talked about this. I'm talking about postmodernism because what we're confronting is postmodernity. I struggled with the concept for a really long time. I didn't quite understand what was meant by the idea of postmodernism. It was actually uh, Tim Keller, the theologian who passed away this year. He had gotten to be a friend of mine, and he explained it to me. Because, like, So I took philosophy in college, and I hated the class. I didn't like it. My kids go to a classical Christian school right now, and they're required to take logic classes. I never had a logic class. Other than in law school, you had to learn it. But the whole uh, the logical arguments and the fallacies and all that, and, and it just it, it goes along with the philosophies. And it just it it it's not that it goes over my head. It's like it never penetrates my head because it's so damn boring. Excuse my language. I just ugh. And, and then you start reading, and and here's something I've learned about academics along the way. So when I was in law school, I took a legal writing class, and I actually, so I've got a law degree, and I have a separate degree in legal writing. And our professor made a point one time, her name was Linda Edwards, she's actually, her husband's now, I think, the bishop for Nevada for the Episcopal Church, uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful lady, great, great, she taught property, she taught legal writing, wonderful law professor. And at some point, she made the statement, and I've heard it from other people since, but she was the first one I ever heard it from, that the people who can't write clearly, the people who load their writing with academic jargon to make it inaccessible are the dumb people. And I don't think she actually said they were the dumb people, but essentially said they're the people who don't know what they're talking about. And they're masking their, their ignorance behind a lot of words. They're making their writing impenetrable. And, and it's not just them. Academics like to keep things in-house. So a lot of academics write things in ways that if you're not an academic, they become impenetrable. You've got to learn the language, and it's a different language from the English language you and I know. The really smart people in the world can take something complex and academic, and they can make it understandable to you. Now, I'm not that person, but I'm smart enough to steal from the smart people and tell you what they tell me. And in this case, Tim Keller. So what is postmodernism? It's at play in the world today. To understand postmodernism, you have to understand what modernity meant. Now, modernity took on a meaning, a philosophical meaning in in universities and among historians and philosophers for what did modernity believe? Modernity believed there was absolute truth. That it may be complex, it may be hard to discern, but if you put enough time and effort into it, you can figure out what the actual truth is. Modernity believed that there could be objectivity, that everyone has a bias. Going into it, everybody has a bias. But that if you understood your bias and you understood there were other viewpoints and you worked very hard to understand the other side and grapple with the idea that there really is a truth that you could overcome your bias, even having it, and you could be objective. You could say this thing is so whether I agree or not. And it may disagree with your biases, but you could get it. Modernity believed in reason so that you and I, though we may be very emotional about things, we could take a truth and use objectivity and reason and separate our emotional impulses to arrive at that thing that is actually true. And above all else, 
modernity believed that you and I coming from different worldviews with presuppositions could, in weighing the evidence based on objectivity and reason, arrive at the same point. Because if you and I, though we see the world in different ways, could all take the same elements of truth and put them together, it would lead us to a, an outcome that both of us could arrive at. That's modernity. Postmodernity is the exact opposite of all of those things. Where modernity uses reason, postmodernity uses emotion. Where modernity believes there is absolute truth, postmodernism believes there is relative truth. Where modernism or modernity believes in objectivity, postmodernism believes there is nothing but subjectivity. And then where they really, really, really separate themselves among all these other separations is that in modernity, there is a belief that exceptions to the rule do not make the rule invalid. And in postmodernity, they believe that exceptions to a rule create a new rule and those things that applied under the old rule become the exception. So how does that look? Well, I want you, if you can, if there are no clouds in the sky, to look out the window. If you've got a window, if you're in a car, you're in your home, you're in your office, and you look out the window and it's daytime and there are no clouds, what color is the sky? Modernity would say the sky is blue. Because 95% to 99% of the people who look at the sky without clouds in the middle of the day and there's no eclipse, you're going to show, you're going to see a blue sky. However, there are some people who are colorblind and they can't see the sky as blue. Therefore, modernity would say the sky is blue, but there are exceptions to the rule. For people color blindness, there's a solar eclipse, so it's dark, there are clouds, things like that. What postmodernity would say is because exceptions, because exceptions exist, there is no rule. So the rule becomes that you cannot say the sky is blue because there are people who cannot see it as blue. You understand that? You got that? That's what's going on. That's what matters. That's the setup. Now, if that boggles your mind a little bit, it should, because it all sounds kind of crazy. So where does post-modernity come from? Post-modernity comes from, of course, French philosophers. And the chief French philosopher, I cannot remember now, oh, what was the guy's name? Starts with a D. Um, but he was a pedophile. So you can see where all of this comes from. You have a French philosopher who is a pedophile who wants the exceptions to become the rule. He likes boys. So one should not objectively say it's bad because he doesn't believe it's bad. Therefore, we should all go through subjectivity. And the moral absolute truth is that pedophilia is bad, but this guy's a pedophile and he doesn't view himself as bad. Therefore, we can no longer use objectivity, nor can we use absolute truth, but must have relative truth. And his truth for him is that he loves boys. Yes, the dude was a pedophile. The, the, the chief theorist for postmodernity was a pedophile who essentially was trying to get rid of the stigma of pedophilia, and he came up with postmodernism, and he was a Marxist philosopher, and the Marxists embraced it, and the universities and colleges embraced it and started teaching it that there is no absolute truth. There is no moral right and wrong. It's all subjective. There is no objectivity. There are no hard and fast rules. Everything is an exception, and because there's an exception— there are no rules. There is no right and wrong. And so how should we see the world instead in terms of power dynamics? Because if there's no right and there's no wrong and there's no truth and there's no lie and there's no rule and there's no exception, the only way to grapple with the world is through who has power and who doesn't. Thus, we arrive at the intersectionality of the modern left. 
the people who have been in charge are the powerful and the oppressor. The people who have not been in charge were the powerless and the oppressed. And we should listen to the powerless and the oppressed, not the powerful oppressor. Now, what happens when the powerless oppressed get in charge? What happens is that they don't admit that they're in charge because there's no absolute truth. You can't go out and say certain things against the alphabet gang or you're going to get canceled because they have the power. Now, here's what's so funny about this is you remember the quote of, you know who's in charge by who you can't criticize, and that's been tied to Voltaire. Well, the quote was actually made famous by a white supremacist. So according to the left, if you use this quote, you're quoting a white supremacist, except the white supremacist got it from a French philosopher. Uh, It was also attributed to Voltaire, and I forget exactly who it was, but it was like an 18th century French philosopher, but it was actually used so much by white nationalists that now it's the white nationalist phrase, even though it's not. It's actually a pretty accurate snapshot of you know who's in charge by who you can't criticize, and you can't criticize so much of the trans community, the alphabet gang. You can't criticize Democrats. You can't criticize non-white people because you get censored. You you get canceled. Uh, You go after the poor Hamas protesters these days, and they accuse you of being anti-Palestinian. They turn everything on its head. And what they don't want, and this is how they play Calvin Ball, with postmodernism is the rules don't apply to them. They create the rules. So call it the, 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 the powerful oppressing the powerless are bad. But a Palestinian activist kills a Jewish man in Los Angeles, well, that's not really murder. It might have been an accident because the Palestinian is more oppressed than the Jew. Therefore, it can't really be considered bad. There's a video circulating online right now of a um, black criminal who used a backhoe to scoop a tear down the wall of a gas station and scoop out an ATM, tied a rope to it, dragged it off with his truck. It's remarkable. I mean, it's pretty brazen. Well, except, I mean, the police in these progressive areas like Los Angeles no longer view it as a crime because crime is now against people and crimes against property have insurance. Therefore, it's a victimless crime. Therefore, it is no crime. That's postmodernism. It's playing itself out all over our society. Postmodernism breaks down society. I believe in truth. Truth is incompatible with postmodernism. The solution is not to play the postmodernist game. It's to fight back with absolute truth because most people in their heart of hearts, in the core of their being, understand there are things that are true and good and things that are bad and wrong. And there are things that are morally right and things that are morally wrong. And you have to pursue people with truth, lovingly, not hostily to change their hearts and minds to get through this period of progressivism. But you need to understand that that is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a philosophy embraced by the academy that is derived from a pedophile who is trying to justify his pedophilia. At the heart of postmodernism is a justification for evil, and we're seeing this around the country and around the world, particularly as people can't bring themselves to criticize what Hamas did on October 7th and can't bring themselves to criticize a transgender shooter at Covenant School in Nashville and can't bring themselves to criticize violent young black men who are committing crimes in this country because of systemic oppression in this country. This is postmodernism. It is a philosophy based on deviancy, based on evil, and it's been embraced by so much of the academic community and by so many kids in this country now. It's polluted and rotted brains. At least understand what you're dealing with, and the way to fight back in all cases is absolute truth.